Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much for tuning in. My name is Julian Rosser, and it's my pleasure to be presenting this event this evening here from the Aetherius Temple in London, England. This is a King Yoga experience. A King, the King part comes from Dr. George King. He was the founder of the Aetherius Society, the organization he founded in 1955. And the uh, spiritual path of the Aetherius Society was named King Yoga after his passing in indifference to him. So tonight we will be looking at the true history, the forgotten history of the human race. We'll be doing a visualization, we'll be sending out some spiritual energy, and we will be listening to some fascinating extracts of Dr. George King himself speaking on this subject from the past. So before we get started, I should tell you a little bit more about Dr. King, because the information we are covering tonight has come either from him or through him. So he lived in, uh, he was born in 1919 in England, and he passed on in 1997. He was an extremely advanced yoga master. He was born, at, well, he was psychic from a young age. And he was very interested in spirituality and, as a young man, threw himself into the study of yoga, practicing for eight to ten hours a day for a decade. And that's on top of an ordinary job. Extraordinary dedication. And this isn't the kind of gentle, relaxing, peaceful yoga. Uh, this was often extremely difficult, demanding, sometimes painful, yoga that had allowed him to develop very unusual yogic and a very advanced yogic abilities. He became a master of uh, different types of yoga such as Nani Yoga, Kundalini Yoga and various others. After a decade of this, to cut a long story short, he reached a point where he was able to tune into and receive communications from beings on other worlds the Cosmic Masters. And this was the beginning of the amazing legacy of Dr. George King. He took over 600 of these cosmic transmissions or messages in which he would go into a very deep trance state, a positive somatic yogic trance state, and allow these Cosmic Masters to speak through him, literally speaking in his voice, using his voice box. And these uh, messages were recorded, and as you can see in that image there, and many of them were transcribed and released as books. And we'll get into an example of one of these a bit later and how it fits into tonight's subject. So to begin then, prior to the human race living upon Earth, we lived on another planet in this solar system. This planet was a green and beautiful world named Maldek. And on this planet, we established a more advanced civilization than we have on Earth today. The people there uh, studied the philosophies, the sciences, but to a more advanced degree than we do here on Earth today. The planet was highly mechanized to the point that they had robots doing most of the menial tasks. Uh, they could travel into space, not a long way into space, because they had a fuel that was too heavy to take them a long way, but they could control the weather uh, so that drought and famine were non-existent. There was an abundance of food, and so the majority of people having all their basic needs met became a very lazy, lackadaisical type of people. However, and uh, this is where the story uh, takes a slightly dark turn. Some people on Maldek delved into the inner workings of the atom in an attempt to gain power and control. And they exploded a hydrogen bomb. Now, this wasn't a hydrogen, well, this was a bomb far more powerful than anything we have on Earth today. So much so that they exploded this bomb and they literally destroyed the planet Maldek. 
And let's be clear, a planet is not uh, just a lump of rock. It's a living entity. It's a living being and not even just alive, but it is an extremely advanced living being. And so the human race through this foolishness not only destroyed themselves, but they destroyed the planet they were living on. And so all that remains now of the planet Maldek is the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And you can see there a, a visual representation of it so that you can get a sense of where it is located in the solar system. Uh, the main asteroid belt contains objects ranging in size from the largest, which is officially, officially classified as a dwarf planet, that's Ceres, at almost a thousand kilometers wide, uh, right down to objects the size of a particle of dust, and a lot in between. The belt is estimated to contain one to two million asteroids that are larger than a kilometer wide. So what happened to all the people living on Maldek when this planet was blown up and destroyed and killed? Well, they had to reincarnate somewhere. They didn't just disappear and cease to exist. And in case you're not familiar with the concept of reincarnation, just briefly, we all reincarnate. We live here on this physical realm of existence here on Earth as you and I are all today. And then when we all pass on, we go to live on another level of vibration. It's still here around Earth, but it's on a different frequency of vibration. And we live there for a time, and then when the time is right, we're reborn here on this physical realm again as a human, and we gain further experience. Hopefully we're progressing, we're evolving, we're advancing. And well, once again, when we die, we pass on to the other realm. And so the cycle goes on, it continues, and we reincarnate time and time again. And it's a method of evolution. Through countless lifetimes, we gradually advance. So all the people, all the billions of people living on Maldek had to be reborn somewhere. At that time, there was already advanced intelligent life living on all of the planets in the solar system on different levels of vibration. So where were the humans going to live? Well, I'll now read an abridged uh, extract from The Nine Freedoms, which is a book by Dr. George King. They could not reincarnate upon Jupiter, because even in those days the inhabitants had reached such a high state of spiritual culture that the planet was used as a reception center for the interplanetary confederation, which actually had its seat upon Saturn. Jupiter with its massive bulk, could well accommodate the thousands of representatives coming from different worlds within and even outside of the solar system to the seat of learning, Saturn. They could not be reincarnated upon Uranus or Venus because both of these peoples had reached such a high state of culture that the involved intelligences from Maldek would not have learned the lessons essential to their further progress. Mercury was already operating as the major communication center for the solar system. Mars was already inhabited by an advanced race who were the engineers and builders in the solar system. So the cosmic hierarchy approached the Earth, the Mother Earth, and out of her great compassion for humanity, she allowed us to be reborn upon her body. Now the Mother Earth too, like Maldek, is a living being. And again, not just a lump of rock, but a highly advanced, highly intelligent, super cosmic master, for want of a better term. And in agreeing to provide a, the human race a home, she knew that she was going to suffer greatly in the course of doing so. She was providing a home to a race of people who had killed a planet, and our history uh, certainly shows that we haven't treated her with much respect. 18 million years ago, the people of Maldek arrived on Earth. 
gradually, after a very long time, the human race, which had gone backwards in evolutionary terms because of what we did on Meldek, gradually evolved back, and eventually we built a new civilization called Lemuria. In Lemuria, uh, we had a more advanced culture than we have on Earth today. At that time, there was a liaison between the planets of Mars and Venus. We were able to communicate with them. But unfortunately, we still hadn't learned from this horrendous mistake we made in the, the destruction of Maldek. So again, the uh, human race split into the white magicians, the black magicians, nothing to do with race or skin color or anything. It's purely white magic versus black magic. And then the uh, majority of people who just didn't really care either way. And the black magicians again delved into the inner workings of the atom in a, in a desire to gain greater power. And again, uh, they exploded uh, atomic weapons, which brought about the downfall of the entire civilization of Lemuria. So backwards the human race went. They didn't destroy the planet this time, it wasn't that powerful, but they destroyed their civilization, backwards they went in, in, in evolution, and they had to gradually evolve over the centuries, gradually evolve back up, and over a very long time, they eventually built up a new civilization. And this one was known as Atlantis. Now Atlantis is a much more uh, sort of commonly heard of name than Lemuria or Maledic. Um, Atlantis you hear about it in popular culture, books, movies, TV, video games, music. And a, a lot of people have uh, written about it over the ages. Um, Plato wrote about it in the 5th century BC and even then he was referring to it as having happened hundreds of thousands of years earlier. Madame Blavatsky, one of the founding members of the Theosophical Society, wrote about it in her epic, The Secret Doctrine, and she wrote about Lemuria in there as well, and other people such as Edgar Cayce and Rudolf Steiner. And more recently, uh, the very popular show, Ancient Aliens, they did an episode on the connection between Atlantis, and extraterrestrial life. And there are many other examples too. So Atlantean people uh, developed this advanced culture. And as an example of this, um, on one occasion, Dr. George King was channeling a cosmic master uh, who went by the name of the Master Aetherius, after whom the Aetherius Society takes his name. And at that time, there was a few people attending and these people were given the opportunity to ask a question to this cosmic master. Quite an honor. Not many people would get the opportunity to do such a thing. And one person asked a question about the use of solar energies and color healing in Atlantean times. And it was quite a technical exchange, but the gist of it is that the Atlanteans were able to store solar energy in crystals. And at one point, the master Aetherius says this, specially prepared quartz shapes put attention upon the ether as the sunlight passed through them. And that tension remained in a particular portion of the ether, as it were. The ether was scrambled, and when they wanted to use this energy, they unscrambled the ether. And they could store these energies in the summer for use in the winter time. Obviously, we have a rudimentary form of this now with solar power, but it certainly wasn't at this level of sophistication that they had in Atlantean times. One other thing I think is very interesting from this exchange uh, was that the Master Aetherius referred to this technology having been developed by scientist priests. Uh, it, it's an interesting term, scientist priests. It's not something that, it's not a phrase we use on Earth today, but it shows that uh, what is possible, I guess, when uh, people have a balance between science and religion. 
And you can read more about that in Dr. King's book, You Are Responsible. And there is a link to that in the description of this video. Eventually, though, the people of Atlantis also fell into the same trap. The white magicians or the scientist priests and the black magicians and the vast majority who just weren't really interested either way. And the black magicians delved into the uh, atom once again and through atomic weapons, they brought about the destruction of the civilization of Atlantis. They didn't destroy the planet, but they brought about the downfall of their civilization. So history repeated itself. The human race went back again, involved. Now, uh, after the destruction of Lemuria, just to go back a bit for a moment, the cosmic hierarchy saw fit to place a barrier around Earth which is sometimes referred to as the ring pass knot. Uh, in science terms, we would call it the ionosphere. Then after the, after the destruction of Atlantis, this barrier was greatly intensified. And this barrier tended to uh, stop the higher forms of inspiration reaching Earth, which meant that advancement was much more difficult. And this had to happen uh, by the law of karma. Action and reaction are opposite and equal. You can't destroy a planet, destroy civilizations without having to deal with the consequences of that. But even, in, uh, even with this having happened, the human race has never been alone. We've always had help, guidance, support available to us from these intelligent beings living on the other planets in the solar system. And as you can see there, I'm referring to people such as Krishna, Buddha, Jesus. These are emissaries of the cosmic masters living on other planets in our solar system. So even in our darkest hour, we've never been left alone. They've always been watching us and there to help us. Even when we've disregarded their teachings, they've still kept coming back to try and help us through these problems. I'd like to now play uh, uh, an extract from Dr. George King speaking about this same story in which he shares some other interesting details about this story. And the full lecture of this is actually available on our website. Um, it's called The Cosmic Plan and it was given in 1974. Now, throughout the ages, mankind was uh, educated, but he was allowed his free will. And where did his free will take him? To the rediscovery of atomic power. And what did he do with it? He destroyed Lemuria. He was not allowed to destroy the planet, but he destroyed his civilization. And just before the destruction of Lemuria, the cities of Shan, great spacecraft from the planet Mars, and this is authenticated, by the way, in your ancient history, I mean your real history, landed upon Earth and evacuated the remnants of the Adamic race uh, and the adepts uh, of those days. The adepts working for good uh, in those days, because there was also adepts of evil as there are today. And Lemuria went down. Again, the remnants of the race uh, procreated themselves and uh, the result was another flourishing civilization uh, which some people have called Atlantis. 
and uh, they uh, got very advanced in certain sciences and certain arts, became learned uh, people, uh, and so on. But there was always the other end of the scale working against the advancers. Uh, and now our story becomes even more unbelievable be than before. I'm sure if you were to write this plot up as science fiction, an editor would turn it down because he'd say, well, okay, it's nicely written and all that, but it's just unbelievable. But this is true. By God, unfortunately, it is true. And if any one of you here is capable of the real true meditation, I don't mean that excuse you've been given for meditation, but I mean real true meditation, go home tonight, go into this meditation and read the Akashic Records for yourself. It's written there. As indeed I have done. Again, the Pandora's box was opened. And again, a fantastic energy was released. And again, it was misused by the few. And another civilization disappeared. Uh, as in Lemurian days, the uh, explosion and conflagration was so great that the planet moved on its axis just as it did in, Atl in, in Atlantean days. And these things can be checked quite easily. It is known beyond any shadow of any doubt that this planet has moved on her axis at least twice. You could not possibly have coal deposits in England unless this had happened. Think about it. Or fish fossils on the highest mountains of the world. Think about it. And then we have the build-up uh, since Atlantis. And very gradually man crawled his way out of the atomic slime out of the gross mutations, the radioactive disease which he had released upon the world, he very gradually climbed his way slowly back up the ladder of, I want to say enlightenment, I won't say it, I'll cross the word out, learning. Uh, until today, and again he's opened the little danger box and again he is playing around with the holy, holy, sacred energies of the atom because it is the most sacred energy on earth is that which is contained in the atom with one exception, that which is contained within your spirit. And where does he stand today? Is he going to destroy the planet again, as he did Maldek? That answer, I can state quite categorically, is no. Because he will not be allowed to do this. He will be allowed to war among himself as he has done in the past, but he will not be allowed to destroy this earth. If it means killing most of the population of the world to save this earth, then that cleansing will, ladies and gentlemen, be brought about. That's a categorical statement of truth.
So the story of Lemuria, of Meldic, Lemuria and Atlantis, it's a very negative one. And we, after all, did murder a planet and destroy two further civilizations. We're talking about people losing their lives in these civilizations and then having to suffer through the evolution that carried on after this. We're all curious about what the civilizations were like, but ultimately these civilizations were a black mark on the human race's history. However, all mistakes, whether they're more normal, mundane, kind of everyday mistakes, or whether they're horrendous mistakes like these, all mistakes offer lessons to be learned. And if we can learn those lessons, we can avoid repeating them for a fourth time. So how do we do this? Well, this brings us to a series of messages uh, or cosmic transmissions, as I mentioned, known as the Nine Freedoms. And these were uh, channeled through Dr. George King uh, by, from a being known as Mars Sector 6. And the Nine Freedoms are a, a series of steps that we all must take in our future evolution as a race, individually and collectively. And the introduction to this book, The Nine Freedoms, is actually where uh, a lot of the information about this true history of mankind has come from. Because it really lays out the story in a very interesting way. But if the human race followed the nine freedoms, these teachings, these spiritual teachings, then the mistakes of these previous civilizations would not be repeated. So what are the nine freedoms? Well, as I said, there are a series of steps, but you could say they were portals or stages or uh, rungs on a ladder of evolution, uh, for want of better terms. But we all must pass through them all eventually as we evolve. And you can see a list of them there now. So just briefly, um, the first one's bravery. And this is an essential requirement in the search for spiritual truth. If tomorrow, for example, one of your work colleagues asks you what you were doing tonight and you talk about how you were uh, like learning a bit more about the true history of mankind, how humanity used to live on another planet, well, there's a certain amount of bravery in doing that because you are risking a little bit of ridicule perhaps from your colleagues, although maybe they are very open-minded and you just don't know it. And so it's not the same kind of bravery as bravery on a battlefield, but nevertheless, uh, bravery is essential uh, to leave the well-trodden path of orthodox thinking and seek out the higher spiritual truths. Love is the second freedom. We're not talking about the basic emotion here, but the energy love that holds together the whole of creation. And we need to learn to manifest this in all of our actions and all of our thoughts. Service to others is the third freedom, and without this we cannot possibly progress beyond a certain point. Next is enlightenment, the dawning of true wisdom, and these lead to cosmic consciousness, which is the control of the power of Kundalini, which uh, allows you to experience true oneness with all things. And when we can do that at will, uh, we are ready for the initiation of ascension, which is literally, well, it's kind of a graduation from the classroom of Earth because it is the, it allows you to escape that wheel of rebirth, the cycle of reincarnation. You no, no longer need to reincarnate upon Earth. You're then free to live and evolve elsewhere in the solar system, literally interplanetary existence, which is the next one. And then after a period of time, a long period of time, uh, you can reach a Saturnian existence and even solar existence, a state beyond our comprehension. So why am I getting into all of this kind of stuff? Well, there is a new age dawning. As part of this, the Mother Earth will raise her vibrations and only those people on Earth who are ready to be able to withstand this raising of the vibrations, this higher spiritual atmosphere that will exist on Earth, will be able to remain here. The rest will have to be reborn on yet another planet where they can continue to gain experience. And as part of this change, a, another cosmic master will come to Earth, an avatar. But this one, unlike Buddha, 
uh, Jesus, Krishna, and so on, these ones who have had their, their true status shrouded in mystery, even to this day, this next master will not be under such limitation. He will come with all the powers. He will reveal himself, prove himself to people. And those who are ready, he will lead them into the new age. And the more we can prepare ourselves for the new age, the better. So how can we do this? Well, to answer that question, I'd like to play another shorter extract this time from Dr. George King about the coming great change. How will the great change take place? Like a thunderstorm? Uh, in which case, uh, very, very violently? Or will it be shaded in so gently and subtly that great deal of suffering, a tremendous amount of suffering, is completely eliminated? And that is the essence, that's the very core of the space message to Earth over this past few thousand years. It's the core of the warning to Atlantis. It's the core of the space message to Earth in these days. And nobody has ever told you anything outside of those limitations, uh, of those boundaries, because outside of those boundaries no human brain can go. And this is your problem. And as spiritual workers, you should take this problem very seriously. And as spiritual workers, most of you do take this problem very seriously. And you're only too willing to send out power and energy and prayer and love to the world as a whole so as to build up the realms of spiritual power uh, so that this will at least do some good. And you might as well know, uh, which some of you do know, but I'll remind you again, that none of your efforts uh, are in vain. None of your prayers, especially if you pray in the right way, are wasted at all. All the energy and all the power you send out at any time is used to some good, no, not good, great purpose, even though you may not know what it is. So. In the vastness of the picture that I've just given you, don't get lost. Don't think, what can poor little me do in that? Don't think this. It's the wrong way to think. The right way to think is, that is a vast, complex picture. It's a vast, complex plan, but somewhere in that whole plan, I am a part. I don't know what part, but I'm a part. I must be not only a part, but an essential part. And this is the way you should look at, at it, because this is the right way to look at it. And then regard it as a challenge to you, and play your part as an essential part of the great scheme of things. And I'll tell you this, if you do, you will never, never regret it. Well, those are some very interesting words there from Dr. George King. So let's do this now, let's play our part and let's send out some spiritual energy. And as a lead into this, I'd like to invite you to join in with me in a, a guided visualization to focus uh, and experience the oneness, the interconnectedness of ourselves with the solar system. So to get the most out of this, I'd encourage you to sort of sit upright, or not, not uncomfortably so, uh, but maybe uncross your legs and 
Try to have your spine a bit upright if you can. Uncross the arms, just so you're sitting comfortably. Close the eyes and just take in a deep breath and then sigh it out and allow the stresses and strains to flow, to fall away. And bring your attention upon the breath. Breathe through the nose and allow the in-breath and the out-breath to become even. So count on the way in and then count the same amount on the way out. So you have a relaxed, even, balanced, in and out-breath. And if you find your mind wandering just gently bring it back to focus upon the breath. And now let's use the power of our imaginations in this guided visualization. So let's go within first. Now let's think of within ourselves and imagine all of the atoms that exist within you, within your body. These tiny solar systems. Imagine the countless billions upon billions of these atoms within you, all of them moving, vibrating with life. The same life that exists throughout the solar system. And now take your mind outwards and upwards. Feel your mind, your consciousness going up out of your body, even above the building you're in and looking down upon yourself and see yourself sitting there quietly. And keep going upwards and see yourself becoming smaller and smaller in that building where you are seated. As you move further and further upwards, you can start to see all the buildings around and the suburb and even maybe the city all around as you go further and further and up, up and up. And your building becomes smaller and smaller, harder to even make out. It's disappearing. Maybe you can see the whole country that you live in now. Neighboring countries keep going up and up and up till you see the curvature of the earth. And gradually the whole of the earth itself. And then turn and look out into the distance to see the mighty sun. And then as you travel further and further away, you can start to see the whole solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Zoom out even further than this and start to see the whole of the Milky Way galaxy. Try to take in this vast galaxy. Think about all the planets that exist within its huge body. Each planet, a small part of a greater whole. And in this context, think of your own tiny self in comparison. And start to see as you observe this great vast space, how intimately connected all these parts are. 
though they are separated by space like the particles of an atom. Just as the atoms within you are joined together to create a greater whole that is you, so too are the planets, the stars, the galaxies all bound together as a unit, as a whole, each part moving in relation to each other part. the galaxy, the solar system and all the planets and you are all made up of tiny atoms vibrating with life. The same life that moves the galaxy through space is the life that drives the atoms within your body. All life is one. Whether it's a tree, or a bird, or a planet, or a galaxy, it is all part of the great whole, sometimes described as the Absolute, or God. And now turn in the opposite direction away from the galaxy and look out into the vastness of space. And using your imagination, see countless galaxies upon galaxies stretching into the distance, into infinity. Trillions upon trillions of stars, planets, countless inhabited worlds. And although you are both an indescribably insignificant speck in the vastness of it all, you are also a part of the greater whole that contains it all. The life that moves the galaxy also lives within your own heart. And now let's bring our minds back from this visualization. Allow yourself to come back, back into the room where you're sitting, and when you're ready, open your eyes. So we're all in this together. We were all on Maldek. We were all in Lemuria. We were all in Atlantis, and here we are all today. How can we stop a repeat of this dark history? There really is only one way forward, spiritual action. Politicians aren't going to change the world. Prayer is what is really needed. And prayer is something that you can do. Anyone can do. Dr. King taught that uh, the best way to pray uh, was by raising the hands, as I'm doing here, so that you can visualize white light shining out from the chakras in the palms of the hands and also from the chakra in the heart. Visualize a great white light shining out. Because prayer is really about sending energy from yourself to uh, the destination of your prayer. So I'd like to invite you all now, if you wish, uh, to join in with a prayer with me. We'll put the words on the screen if you want, but if you like, you can just close your eyes and visualize white light flowing out from you as I say this prayer. So if you want to join with me now, raise the hands and visualize the white light flowing out. O oh, wondrous God, we ask at this time for your power and love to flow forth now to help the whole of humanity to rise up from the mistakes of the past 
to raise our collective consciousness to a higher level and to give greater service to others so that we might go forward into the new age, living in the light of our divine heritage and in harmony as one. O mighty God, may your divine will be done. And then we close off the prayer by wiping the right palm over the left. That closes off the prayer. It stops the flow of energy. So thank you for joining in with that. And uh, uh, I hope you found that uh, an interesting experience. Right now, uh, though, we've got time to move into our question and answer session. So I'm going to have a look now at the chat and uh, we'll see what it's got in store for us. So forgive me, I'm just going to have a bit of a look down here and uh, see what we have as far as questions go. And hopefully I can answer them. Okay, where are we here? If you do have any questions, please fire them away. Type them in the chat here. Oh, someone's um, asked here, you mentioned uh, life on other planets. Could we see these civilizations on other planets if we went there? Well, uh, yes and no. If we uh, went there and we went to the right level of vibration uh, that life existed upon, then yes, we could see them. But if we went to a level of vibration where there was no life, then we could look all day uh, and we would never see them. And, I, you know, this is part of NASA's problem is they may be looking on the wrong levels of vibration when they visit some of these planets. It's just like if you look here on Earth, we people live on other levels of vibration on Earth when they pass on. Uh, we can't normally see them on a day-to-day -day basis. Some people can and you know, can communicate with people on other realms occasionally, but it's not the norm. But they are there. We just can't see them. And it's exactly the same on other planets. They live on different levels of vibration. So a lot of people can li believe that life after death exists on Earth. Uh, it's quite reasonable, in my mind at least, that it's natural that obviously it must also be the case that there's life on other realms of existence on other planets. But humanity as a whole hasn't quite got there yet. But it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, what contact did these civilizations have with beings from space? How did any contact take place? Well, uh, from Dr. George King, we don't have a great deal of information on this, but we do know that these previous civilizations, uh, Maldek, Lemuria, and Atlantis, all had at least some form of contact with uh, the advanced other uh, planets. And that may, whether that was communication or whether that, that was them visiting in a more open way, sharing technology and, and that kind of thing, um, but what we, what we do know in the story, and a couple of things that have come out tonight is um, from the stories, at least uh, at the destruction of some of these civilizations, certain people were evacuated. So that would have meant the landing of spacecraft on Earth and taking people away. Um, but even now we are visited by these extraterrestrials. As I say, uh, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, and others, but they just are... Uh, uh, and aren't recognized as being such. But yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. If there was an all-out nuclear war, would we be allowed to destroy the Mother Earth in the same way we destroyed Meldek? Well, that's a good question too, thank you. But no, the Cosmic Masters have said quite definitively, uh, no, that is a definite no. That's not going to happen the human race would be destroyed before the Mother Earth. She suffered 
enough. It has been a great deal. So that will not happen. So uh, someone says, there, is other life pure energy then? Well, that's, that's a very good question because I've been saying, okay, there's life on other planets and it's on another level of vibration. Well, what does that mean? Well, just as here on Earth, if you go to live on another level of vibration, as we have all done when we've died previously, and as we will do when we leave this life, on that level of vibration, life feels kind of physical to us. It's, it's, it's kind of physical. You have physical things that you can touch. You aren't, you aren't an energy as such. It's a different, it's not as physical, especially on the higher levels. It's a kind of finer physicality, but it is still definitely physical. When you get to the other planets, because they're more advanced, in some cases, uh, such as on Saturn, they literally may be an ovoid uh, being, egg-shaped kind of ball of light that just uh, stands still for effectively almost eternity. So the more advanced you are, yes, the more it does move away from a kind of physical life form that we are used to here on Earth. But um, not in all cases. So, we, and we have you know UFOs arriving here, uh, being seen on Earth. Those are uh, cr uh, there's people in those beings from other worlds, and they're flying those craft. You know, they're, they're physical beings in a physical craft. Uh, could could you expand a little more on the coming master? Uh, specifically what you meant by less mysterious. Well, I guess what I mean by that is the Master Jesus, uh, uh, he came from the planet Venus. He said it in the Bible, I'm from the bright and morning star. Look it up, Revelations. And he was born in a manger. And there was, although three wise men came to a star of Bethlehem, which uh, was a UFO, uh, he was not he wasn't he didn't kind of come out and say hey i'm from another planet the next master is not going to be born under these kind of uh, ordinary kind of situation whereby he couldn't be mistaken as an ordinary person he will come and reveal himself now he will prove himself to humanity that uh, he will prove his credentials exactly what that means we don't know but he will have uh, very advanced powers and if you wonder what that would mean, I mean, think to you, what, what would it take for you to be convinced that someone was extraterrestrial? Maybe that's what they would do, or maybe they would do something even more uh, amazing than that. I hope that sort of addresses that question to some extent. Okay, so... Uh, someone says here, I believe I was much more spiritually and culturally advanced in past civilizations. I look at my life now and it's, a spirit and it's spiritually a struggle. Could this be residual karma from blowing up Maldek? Well, yeah, I mean, the whole human race is, is dealing with the karma. Um, you know, karma, it says that action and reaction are opposite and equal. That's how Buddha said it. Uh, Jesus said, as you sow, so shall you reap. Essentially, you do something and something happens to you in return. If you do a good thing, uh, a good thing, good or uh, will happen to you back. So when, because we've done these really negative things, destroying our civilizations, there is a karmic kind of kickback. It's, got, it's like what goes around comes around. And so the whole of the human race is really having to deal with this. And that is why we are... Yeah, that, that's a lot of why we find ourselves in the position we're in today. If we hadn't done this, if we'd carried on the uh, projection of our advancement from uh, Maldek, for example, we would still be living on Maldek, presumably, and we would be amazingly more advanced than we are today. But because of our actions, we just had to go so far back. And then it's just a very long uh, struggle to come back again. So oh, let's see if I can answer one more question here. These are really great questions. Oh, here's a good one. Could the master be a she? Well, yes. I mean, 
Absolutely. I mean, when you get to this uh, level of advancement, and this is addressed in the nine freedoms uh, to some extent, uh, sex, he or she, is, is really not even a factor. It's, it's, that's really more about magnetism. Uh, it's kind of a positive negative magnetism. It's nothing to do with gender. It's far actually above uh, gender as we sort of see it on Earth. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's no kind of, um, it's not like it's a male dominated kind of a thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's much higher than that. So it, it is interestingly uh, sort of addressed in the nine freedoms in some ways, but that's a very, very good question there. So I think I'm going to have to wrap it up. I'm sorry I can't get to all those questions. Uh, I would really love to, uh, but my email uh, will be put in the chat there by uh, our chatter, Darren. And so feel free to email me. I'm happy to try and answer any of the questions that you have afterwards. Alternatively, uh, we are going to have a Zoom follow-up call from this, uh, which will be on Saturday the 18th of, September, of December at 3 p.m. And if you registered online for this event, we'll send you a, a Zoom link that you can, if you want to join in with that. And if you didn't register online, if you just tuned in, then again, you can email me and I'll be happy to send you that link. So that'll be a bit more of a, a two-way conversation. We can... Uh, uh, kind of um, have a bit more of a chat and perhaps answer some more of these questions that I can see coming through. Now, in a couple of minutes, we also have uh, an online 12 blessing service. This is something that we do quite frequently here, virtually every day, especially since the um, pandemic started. And uh, that's on our website, 12blessings.org, 12blessings.org, as you can see there. And that's a 20, uh, sort of 30 minute service where we will join together with other people all around the world to send out spiritual energy out into the world. But that's all uh, from me and now. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. It's been a pleasure and I hope to have a chat with some of you at that uh, event on Saturday the 18th. So thank you. And may God bless you all.